We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight among those in full vigor. We are like dead men. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. If you would, please open a Bible to Isaiah 59, but also Mark 10. As it turns out, these two passages talk to each other rather remarkably well. It's probably all intended by the, you know, the, the ancient people, the cavemen who created the lectionary or whatever. But anyway, um, for probably obvious reasons, they, they are both working, working well together because they both deal with the idea of blindness as a kind of metaphor for spiritual amnesia and a spiritual amnesia that invariably leads to spiritual isolation uh, from God chiefly, but as it follows uh, from other people as well. So what I wanted us to do this morning is to look first at our reading from Isaiah 59, to see the scope and the impact of this problem for Israel, for God's people. In other words, um, it's not the scope and impact of this problem for all those unwashed heathens out there who are all probably going to vote for the wrong political candidate in the next week or two. It's not for them, right? Uh, it's not any kind of them being blind, but it's about us. It's about you and me, the people of God being blind. We who have heard the word of God and seen the truth, but have somehow forgotten, grown cold, indifferent, distracted by competing desires and wants and needs, and in the process having had the scales, as it were, come down over our eyes, blinding us to that truth we once knew, to that truth we once saw. And so I want us to first look at that in Isaiah 59, then turn to our gospel reading from Mark to see how it's doing the same thing, but differently showing us in Bartimaeus our blindness, and then showing us our only hope, surprise, surprise, in Jesus. All right? Well, let's dig in. First of all, if you've got a Bible open, let's back up before our reading proper to Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, because those verses set up the conditions for the predicament being described in our reading proper. This is verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear dull, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. All right? And those two verses capture rather well the active character of sin in our lives, the dynamic role that sin has in building up that wall of iniquity, as our passage imagines it, this building up of patterns of choosing something other than God and what he wants for me. And not just even primarily in the big things, although sometimes in the big things, not just primarily in the big choices, but especially in the little things, in the little choices, in the seemingly insignificant, uh, otherwise unimportant decisions where you might not even think about what God would choose for you in that moment, might not even think it important. It's the idea that choosing sin becomes something that one is perhaps not even conscious about in any given moment, uh, so much as so that you can't even call it choosing. It's rather that sin begins to choose you in a way. You give your feelings, for instance, your feelings of anger or jealousy or lust or whatever, free reign in your thoughts without any kind of correction, without any kind of noticing, perhaps. You open your mouth to brag or to snap or to complain without a second thought, without a second little criticism going off in your head that maybe, maybe this is not the right thing to do right now. Or maybe it's worse than that. And all those things, all those seemingly insignificant things, and maybe even no one else notices, they build calluses, both to God and to sin itself. We become callous to feeling sin in my life to be, well, sin. Something that God doesn't want for me, and therefore something that I shouldn't want for myself. Sin becomes less and less offensive. It becomes something more and more easy as those calluses build up. And in that process of callousing, our sin makes a separation, as our reading puts it, between God and us. It builds a wall. And it's a wall that most definitely is not on God's end. St. Augustine talks about the reality that God is closer to me than I am to myself. Right? Think about that. God is closer to you than your breath. God is closer to you than your thoughts, even when they're filled with sin. God is closer to you, even your own sense of you. He's closer to you than all that. He is the one, as St. Paul puts it, in whom we live and move and have our very being. But funny how it never quite feels like that, right? It never feels like he's that close. I mean, maybe you all are just way more spiritual than I am. It's entirely possible, right? 
but on my best day, right? In my best experience of prayer. You know, that, those moments where the, you know, the closest things I get to the heavens being opened wide and just the sense of God is, you know, present, right? At best, maybe he feels like he's sitting across the room from me, right? It's on his cell phone, probably, right? And he looks up at me, like, you know, probably it's something I just said, like, and he's only looking up because you know, I probably sound like a doofus, right? <laughs> Right? But hey, at least he's listening, right? Those are my high moments of prayer. But that, in a way, is a kind of separation from sin. The fact that I don't feel him to be that intimate, right? But God's not distant from us. We're distant from him, right? We're the ones like Adam and Eve who are hiding in the garden, as it were, because we don't like the fact that we are emperors without clothing. And it's a snowball effect because the effect of that fear and that hiding is more sin and more calluses and more separation from God, which leads to more fear and more hiding and more sin and more calluses and more separation from God. It's like shampoo instructions, right? <laughs> right? Rinse, wash, repeat. That's what happens. And all that spills out from my relationship with God into my relationship with my family and my neighbors and the rest of the world, which is where our reading begins. Verse 9. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. Now, justice and righteousness in Scripture are basically holiness at the level of human relationships. And the idea here is that broken relationships with other people are the fallout from a broken relationship with God. It's inescapable. In fact, it's one of the first points that Scripture makes abundantly clear. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin, and God comes to them in the garden asking, where are you? In Genesis 4, then, next thing that happens, Cain murders his brother, and God comes to him asking, where is your brother? The echo of that question, where? It's meant to draw your attention to that relationship between our brokenness with God and our brokenness with our neighbor. But here's the thing. On a day-to-day basis, I might be able to ignore my separation from God. I don't advise it. I don't advise it. But I might be able to ignore it. I might be able to avoid church. I might be able to avoid prayer. Heck, that's why YouTube was invented, right? right? I might be able to avoid anything that's going to remind me how seriously calloused my relationship with God is. But unless I go to live in a cabin in the woods, hundreds of miles from civilization to become, you know, the Unabomber or something, right? There's probably no way that I can avoid how messed up my relationship with other human beings actually is, right? In my marriage, with my kids, with my parents, with my boss and coworkers, with everybody else on Route 79 trying to get to Pittsburgh the same time I am. But the silver lining here And it's kind of what our reading is getting at. The silver lining here is that it's often the hurt and the brokenness in those relationships that drives us to realizing that something is indeed wrong, right? With the world, of course, of course, but maybe also if we're in a mood for honesty with ourselves. And you can see that, that sense of knowing that something's wrong in the language of verses 10 and 11. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight among those in full vigor. We are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but there, for salvation, but it is far for us. First, notice that image of blindness, and we'll get back to that. But second, notice the image of groaning and groping and stumbling, right? It's the imagery of, well, incompetence at real basic stuff. When does one have to grope along a wall? Well, when it's night, when it's dark, when you simply can no longer see. What kind of person is prone to stumbling? Well, those who can't walk or those who can no longer walk, right? Think toddlers, the injured, the elderly, the mobility challenged, as it were. And then there's the imagery of hopelessness, futility, frustration, moaning and groaning for things just to be right, hoping for, well, hope in a world of no hope. And if you've been there, if you've hit rock, a rock-bottom moment in a broken relationship with someone, the end of a marriage, or at least that's what it looks like, parents who want to disown you, and they probably have every right to do so, right? children who can't stand your guts and you know you really can't blame them, a friend who feels thoroughly betrayed, if you've ever seen the end of a relationship that you thought you treasured, but clearly you didn't, where the calluses had built up over the years and you didn't know it, or maybe you did and just didn't seem to care at the time, well, you probably know, you probably feel viscerally, personally, everything that Isaiah is talking about here. The hopeless frustration, the powerlessness, maybe even if you're lucky, remorse, regret, although seemingly too late now. 
But the thing is, this checkmate, right, this relational checkmate is humanity's state on its own. It's God's people even on their own. When they have become as callous to God as those who never knew him at all, they become people who can't see, people who can't walk, and in the worst of it, people who seem to have no hope and no ability to hope. But the hope in Scripture here is the same hope as the hope found everywhere in Scripture. Our hope is always in God, in God alone. Verse 16. He saw that there was no man. That is, who is there who can turn around from all that? Who can break down that wall of separation from God? Who can unblind himself and see? Who can heal himself and walk? Who can do all that and find hope? Well, there's no one. And so continuing, and God wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Right? God is a mighty warrior come to save. And that's just true, plain, and simple. To paraphrase Paul, there is no one righteous. No, not a one. There is no one to intercede. There's no one to fix the stinking, awful mess that we've made of everything. And so God, God has to do this himself. God stands up and basically says, hold my beer, right? right? And frankly, frankly, that is as good a Western PA image of the incarnation as you're ever going to get. And it's also what we see in our gospel reading in the picture of Jesus come to Bartimaeus. The incarnation, the flesh and blood reality of those verses 16 to 17 from Isaiah has indeed come as the salvation of God to blind, broken human beings. Let's look now at the end of Mark 10. On the surface, it's a straight-ahead story, right? Jesus heals a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. Right, good for you, Jesus. Nicely done, right? And honestly, if we stop there, on its own, that would preach nicely. Neatly echoing Isaiah's imagery of blindness and misery and need of God's healing, because that's good stuff. And clearly, clearly it's bigger than just some random story about a lucky guy getting his optic nerves fixed. Right? I mean, look at what immediately follows our reading. It's the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In other words, this is the last story before the beginning of Mark's passion narrative. It has kind of a capstone feel to it, our story, a summation from Mark of why Jesus has come and what he has come to do, namely to be God's answer to our blindness and hopelessness that Isaiah 59 captures so well, our blindness to sin, our blindness to how it separates us from God, our blindness to how it destroys our human relationships, our blindness to the fact that it is insurmountable by us on our own and that we need a Savior and that Savior ain't us a savior to restore not just our sight, but our relationship with God and with each other. And of course, in our gospel story, once Bartimaeus is healed and has his sight restored, what's the first thing he does? Second half of verse 52, and immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. He recovers his sight and up and away follows Jesus. In other words, that wall of separation between him and, well, God, it comes crashing down. He is literally near God, and he clearly wants to continue to be near God once he can see. And that's good stuff, and that'll preach, but let's dig a little deeper. St. Augustine, what he found strange about our reading, and it is strange if you notice it, but even if Augustine is strange for noticing it in the first place, right? What Augustine knows about our reading and found strange is that Mark feels the need to name Bartimaeus' father here. Verse 46, and they came to Jericho, and as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Now, that's strange for a few reasons. First, why mention his father at all in this story? It's not like his dad comes walking in and does something. Heck, Mark didn't even tell us the name of that rich man earlier in the chapter that we talked about a couple weeks ago. As a matter of fact, after a quick skim of all Mark, Bartimaeus seems to me to be the only person Jesus heals uh, that, that Mark chooses to name in his gospel. We get close. We get close with the raising of Jairus' daughter. But there, the father is named, not the girl. However, here in our reading, Mark makes sure we not only know that this guy's name is Bartimaeus, but also his father's name too, Timaeus, which is actually doubly super sus. Because the name Bartimaeus simply means in Aramaic, Son of Timaeus. 
And so verse 46 literally reads, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus was sitting by a roadside. And that's weird. And it's made people, not just Augustine, wonder why. Now, one possible reason, which is how we predictable moderns are going to always approach these things, is that, well, it's clearly a historical detail. In other words, Mark's just being historically accurate, even if that detail is completely meaningless to you and I. Of course, that doesn't answer why the Holy Spirit has included this little detail, knowing that it would be completely meaningless to the vast majority of God's people through the ages that have read Mark's gospel as their holy scripture. So let's scratch that. Another possibility is that Mark is ghosting Plato, the Greek philosopher, right? Because Plato has a book, a philosophical dialogue called, wait for it, Timaeus, which is all about creation, the nature of reality, and the nature of, wait for it, seeing. Indeed, in the Gospel of Mark, the trajectory of all the miracles up to this point has systematically been demonstrating Jesus' lordship over every aspect of creation. It's kind of what Mark does in his build-up to the passion. Nature in the calming of the storms, the supernatural in casting out demons, over disease in the healing of the bleeding woman, over death in the raising of Jairus' daughter, etc., etc. And in the final miracle, before the Passion, before Palm Sunday in Mark 11, in this final miracle of healing blindness, Mark is lobbing a grenade of gospel truth and logic at Plato and Greek philosophy. In other words, if you want to see, truly see the nature of creation, you need to see the Lord of creation, the God of creation, the word through whom all things were made. You need to see Jesus. And that, being able to see Jesus as God, is what it means to be healed of human blindness. And I like that. It's, it's really quite cute, actually. But to be honest with you, I frankly haven't read a lot of Plato, and I had to Google all that for the, to get a summary of the book to find out even what all that was about. And given that the Holy Spirit did not include Plato's Timaeus in the canon of Scripture, heck, he didn't even put it in the Apocrypha, I'm going to work from the assumption that I need to figure out the meaning of Scripture uh, from Scripture, that Scripture is generally going to be meaningful through Scripture. And so for us, I think it's just best we consider what the name means. And as it turns out, it means, in a weird way, two completely contrary things. In Greek, it carries the sense of honor, of being highly prized. But in Hebrew, in Aramaic, the root of the word is teme, which means pretty much the opposite, defiled, contaminated. But here's the thing. That's a picture of Israel, right? That's a picture of God's people. That's a picture of us. Right? Think about who Israel is in the Old Testament. She is God's beloved, highly prized, given the place of honor in God's heart above every other nation on the earth, chosen to save all nations, chosen to bless all humanity, and to bring them back to him. And yet, although love like that, God's people, Israel, the church, you and me, all of us, we are also all contaminated, defiled, calloused over, ruined by sin. The chief symptom of which embodied in the figure of Bartimaeus, who is the son of, if you will, both inestimable worth and tragic defilement, the chief symptom of which is blindness, which has clearly reduced him to the state of beggary that the story depicts him in, sitting by the roadside, helpless, hopeless, and destitute. And yet, into Bartimaeus's life, into his story, and therefore into ours, comes the God of salvation. And the moment is interesting, but very subtly, painted as no less a moment than exactly that, the God of salvation come marching in to rescue and redeem from defilement that which is highly prized by him. First, Bartimaeus seems to know this. He seems to crave this, just like that groaning Israel from Isaiah 59, 11. This is Mark 10, 47. And when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus calls Jesus son of David. It's a messianic title. He calls him that twice here, back to back. And it's the only time in all Mark's gospel that that title gets used. There's a hint of it in the next chapter, in verse 11 of the triumphal entry story, but Mark places the full title not on the lips of the crowd that will shout crucify him in less than a week's time, but on the lips of Bartimaeus, this figure for Israel, who will see and who will then follow when he sees Jesus. But here's more. But there's more. Look at the first verse of the story. It's another one, right next to the Bartimaeus Timaeus thing. It's another one of those, what the heck is Mark doing moments? Verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho, 
right? Mark clearly wants you to note something here about Jericho, even if nothing seems to happen in Jericho. Either that or he needs a better editor, which, given his editor is the Holy Spirit, seems unlikely. So let's work from that. So let's start with where is Jesus coming from? We get a little bit of geography in 1032, right? Mark says they're on the road to Jerusalem, but that's actually kind of telling more about where Jesus is heading, right? And, and sort of more theologically than that, because he's heading to the cross, right? Which is awaiting him shortly in Jerusalem. To figure out where Jesus is coming from, we've got to go back a page, back to verse 1 of chapter 10. And he, Jesus, left there, that is Capernaum, in the north, and went to the region of Judea, that is in the south, and beyond the Jordan. Right? In other words, Jesus crosses the Jordan. He leaves the promised land proper, but then at the beginning of our reading, it's telling us, Mark's telling us in essence, that Jesus has come back into the promised land and straight along the path taken by Joshua and Israel in the conquest. And just as the conquest aimed to remove the defilement of the land, Jesus has come back to remove the defilement of all the world, of all his people, represented in Barimaeus in this final story before the Passion, through the cross. Here in the last story before the Passion, Mark gives us a picture in one poor, blind beggar of what Jesus has come to do, what the cross means for all God's people, that God's hand, as Isaiah 59, 1 promises, is very much not shortened, and he can very much save. And in Jesus, he has come once and for all to conquer and to save, to remove the defilement and the darkness, to tear down the walls that we've built, to restore our sight, and to give us legs to walk and follow him, and all of that so that we might have hope. And all of that through the cross. And that salvation is indeed once and for all, but it's also always and again. Always and again, finding ourselves at the foot of that cross and letting the steadfast love of God for you there draw you out of hiding, out from behind the walls we've built up, letting it scrape away all the calluses, even when that's painful, letting it open up our eyes to see the truths about ourselves that we might not want to see, but all so that we might know the true worth that we have in the eyes of God, who sees through all our defenses anyway and loves us to death nevertheless. And so to him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.